Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Seek and Destroy. And today we are going to review The Batman. And I am going to get into spoilers. So if you haven't seen the movie at this point, uh, you know, definitely go away now. Watch the movie yourself if you don't want to be spoiled. And then come back here and join the conversation down in the comments below after you see the film. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about something they just added recently. So I'm glad I kind of took some notes and waited on, uh, you know, talking about this movie. Because we just got a deleted scene uh, that features the Joker. And I'll talk a little bit about that in this video also. So if you haven't seen that yet, I'll put a link to that down below. You can go watch it, and that way you're ready for our discussion. So, the Batman. Um, first and foremost, I'm going to just not really join in on the amount of praise this movie has gotten. I do not do not dislike this movie at all. I think it's a very good movie. Um, but a lot of people out there are just, you know, it's their favorite Batman movie. It's the best one. It's the best one it's ever been. And and that's great. I always love when, you know, when Amazing Spider-Man came out and then like the Spider-Man Homecoming, like every generation gets their Batman. And some of the voices, though, that are that are praising this movie are people my age or older that had different versions of Batman first. And and they really did like this version. And like I said, I liked it, too. But me and my friend Nate, who saw this together, we both left with the same exact feeling, which is, OK, so that was someone else's take on Batman. We didn't. We, our minds weren't blown. But the reason for that, for me at least, is because I don't like a realistic Batman. Um, that that does not interest me at all. Uh, when you ground him so much, like they do in this movie, uh, to, to the point where he's like literally knocking on doors, and uh, you know, to get into criminal hideouts, I'm like, okay, that's so. That's uh, I don't know. I, I it it provided a nice humor moment for the movie. Um, and then they called it back later when he showed up at the club as Bruce Wayne uh, and knocked on the door. But uh, to me, it just, I don't know. I, I didn't really, I like the, the aspect of Batman where he's um, a little unrealistic, you know, where he is a guy in a costume, sure, but he'll appear out of nowhere, like, like a vampire. Um, or he fights villains like Clayface who can, you know, who are like 10 feet tall and can morph into these, you know, different creature things and, and make, you know, his arms into weapons and, and, uh, you know, he fights like a 10 foot killer croc. And I, I just like that version a lot better. And I'm I'm dying to see that version on screen. Uh, we have not seen a version like that uh, on the, the live, you know, live action. Um, I think the probably the closest we've gotten is Ben Affleck because he exists in a world with gods, you know, with other beings. So Clayface and those kind of characters probably exist in the Snyderverse, uh, which is a world that I didn't really like too much. Um, I'm not a hater of it. I just, it didn't really like pull me in completely. Although I did kind of like his Justice League movie. Um, that was probably my favorite of his three movies was uh, the Justice League, the Zack Snyder cut. So this was just like, okay, it's another grounded, realistic Batman. And and like kind of like Nolan, only this one went a, even more grounded than the Nolan ones did. Um, so that for me, it just didn't work. So that that's why I want to get that up front of why this movie wasn't like the mind blowing movie it was to me. But I know a lot of you out there probably really love this movie, so I want to hear why down below. And if, if the realistic thing worked for you, whatever it is, let me know. Because there were elements in this movie that were really strong. First of all, the visuals were great. Uh, the music was great. Uh, the acting was really great. Uh, all the characters that they picked for this film worked really well together. I mean, I remember Batman Begins had, you know, Carmine Falcone in it. It also had, uh, you know, the Ra's al Ghul and Ducard technically as two different people for a while and then streamlined it into one character um they had scarecrow and they also had zazz so that's like four villains in the first you know batman begins movie and they pulled that off really well this movie does the same thing um although it's longer so it has more time to pull that off but you get riddler you get penguin you get catwoman and you get carmine falcone and they also mentioned maroney you know some of the other mob bosses that were in gotham you know in that time and that's what i really liked because they they do reference the comics a lot um there's a you know, little little hints here and there about the world, uh, but mostly it is Matt Reeves' version of this world. You know, he kind of picks and chooses some things. Like, I felt like in some areas he kind of went the animated series route, which is great for the animated series. But in this movie, I felt a little jarred from it, where it was uh, Bruce Wayne doesn't live in Wayne Manor. Uh, I think we talked about that when we read the prequel novel. Um, so a lot of that stuff still rang true. You know, his dad was running for mayor when he died and all that stuff. So all that from the novel was in this movie um, but Bruce lives downtown like in the, I guess the financial district wherever Wayne Towers is and he has his own loft or penthouse I guess where he works uh, and then way down below underground is where his kind of train station slash bat cave is and him and Alfred like they live in this room that is just very gothic in architecture like there's these iron uh, uh, 
structures like on the sides they're kind of bronzed a little bit and, and kind of darker and brown and it just like it looked like a set piece from a tim burton movie but then when you go outside everything looks very modern you know like modern i think they shot some of this in in the uk um so it kind of had that vibe a little bit of new york vibe to it at, at times um you know so it, it was like blending things in an attempt to be timeless the way the animated series was or at least that's the impression i got and I, I just didn't think it worked that well. Sometimes I'd see a set and I go, oh, what the hell? This does not feel like it's part of the world that uh, is outside. Because every time they show these really great cinematic shots of Gotham, you know, whether it's uh, aerial shots or going through the streets on the Batmobile or on, you know, or near his motorcycle, like, you know, attached to him while he's riding his motorcycle or Catwoman on her motorcycle, like no matter what it was, you would get these really beautiful shots. But then you're looking around, and you're just like, it, it's clear that it's different places. Like even at the end, I think when they're, you know, Batman and Catwoman are riding off in, you know, on their bikes, and then they split because they're going to go different ways. Um, you know, like in life, I guess <laughs> she's going to Bloodhaven, which I thought was a cool reference. Um, so anyway, so they're they're splitting, and that was really beautiful. But you can tell that that's nowhere in the United States, uh, and that's fine, I guess, because you're. They, that was a little bit like in Batman Begins, they did that too, where they showed Wayne Manor and you're just like, okay, yeah, there's no way this is in the US the way it just looks. Um, so I don't know, to me, it didn't have a consistent uh, vibe uh, as far as set pieces and, and uh, the world and stuff. Like for a, the amount of work they put into this movie to get the visuals and the story really well done, I was just surprised at some of the inconsistencies, uh, inconsistencies with uh, with some of the locations and sets. Um, I just didn't feel like some of them inhabited the same world um, because, and again, like I said, I feel like they're going for that timeless vibe and it, they just didn't do it enough to make it work. You know, the animated series didn't just do Gothic architecture with current architecture um, and current uh, mechanics with past style mechanics or anything like that, or technology from now and technology from then. It was like a combination of everything. So TVs in the animated show were black and white. Uh, still, you know, and and shaped differently, you know, they were kind of boxy looking. Um, and so they, they were in like the phone Batman used was a, it, it could do high tech things for a rotary looking phone, but it was still looked like a like a classic phone. So there's things like that in this where I, I feel like they just didn't go far enough into that. But I think that's because Matt Reeves wanted it to feel more realistic. And they definitely pulled that off. Uh, and that's, like I said, to me, kind of a detriment. But overall, like the characters, I thought Penguin was amazing. Uh, Colin Farrell was one of the reasons I went to see this movie because I've always wanted him to you know, play Batman himself. And so to hear that he was playing Oswald Cobblepot, the Penguin, I just was so excited. So he's great in the movie. He's not in it a ton, but he does. He is a pivotal part of a lot of the setup from the crime world, you know, then going into the world of the freaks. You know, that's kind of how long Halloween was, where it was the end of the Carmine Falcone empire and the Maroni empire and was bleeding into the Jokers and the Riddlers and the Scarecrows of the world and Poison Ivies and stuff. So that's kind of what this movie is. It's year two of Batman and it's him figuring out, you know, now that he's established himself, you know, where, where he goes from here as the villains escalate. And that's the Riddler. The Riddler is the escalation of that. And he kind of inspires, you know, by the end of the movie, Penguin and other uh, characters to kind of come out of the woodworks and see Gotham in a new way and, and, and be able to provide new threats for Gotham against someone like a Batman. Um, so I, I liked all that. The beginning where Batman is kind of accepted by the police, kind of, at least by one police officer, uh, Commissioner Gordon, who's not commissioner yet. I think he's lieutenant. So that was a great relationship uh, throughout the movie. I thought Jeffrey Wright was amazing. And that whole opening where Batman's narrating, it reminded me of the Punisher War Journal, where he's like, uh, you know, December 15th you know, I broke someone's jaw today, <laughs> you know, or something like that. It's like, that was really cool. I really dug that. It pulled me into the movie really quickly. And that whole beginning where Batman is, they're, like they're showing a bunch of criminals doing petty things like stealing a purse or robbing a convenience store or beating up a guy at a, you know, at a, a train station or something. All these things were happening. And meanwhile, everyone, you know, the people doing these crimes will kind of look over and they'll just see this dark area where they can't tell what's in the dark. And it's them fearing that Batman is there. So they're like giving the purse back or, or leaving the money back at the convenience store or, running or just running away in fear. And it was just Batman saying, I've been so effective, at least on some level, that they are actually thinking twice about doing these crimes because I can't be everywhere at once. So if I can just spread the word 
it might prevent a couple crimes. You know, it's kind of like when you work in retail and just you standing around near things will deter people who want to steal from stealing because you're right there. You know, you're talking to them, whatever the case is. Um, that's kind of what Batman's effect is he's trying to do. And I really like that. But even he admits that it's it's not working. Like it's the crime is up, you know, in Gotham, no matter how many super criminals or mob bosses he takes down. Uh, even in this story, it's in the wake of Carmine Falcone um, kind of being pushed underground and Maroney uh, being taken off the streets. And he was running some drug rink that now Penguin has picked up on. But then as you learn throughout the film, you know, Penguin is working for Carmine Falcone. And it turns out so are all the other politicians and the people of power in Gotham. Because when Bruce Wayne's dad died, he was about to implement this program that would rejuvenate Gotham. And when he died, Carmine Falcone and all these, you know, creepy mobsters and, and politicians came in and capitalized off of it. And they found a way to make themselves richer and more powerful off of this program and make the people that it was made to help, you know, poorer people or people middle, lower middle class, it pushed them down further. And so I love that. Actually, that was a really clever element to add to all this uh, with, you know, the background of Bruce Wayne's parents, because that story has been told so many times. So it's nice to see a new wrinkle added to it. But because of that new wrinkle, I started having expectations of what the Riddler was after, because the Riddler is kind of like um, Saw, you know, he's kind of like a jigsaw in the, in the Saw movies where he, he thinks he, or he's taken down people that he deems evil and who are corrupt and all this stuff. And so there's a, a level of people in Gotham going, well, you know, maybe Riddler is doing the right thing. Maybe he's doing what Batman can't. He's actually killing people who are at the root of the problems of our city. And Batman has to kind of deal with that and work against it, you know, and try to do things his way. And I, I kind of like that whole dynamic. But by the end, I was hoping that Riddler had a much bigger plan. I think I had theorized before this movie came out that the Riddler was trying to expose the Court of Owls. That, uh, that he was going to reveal that there was corruption at the center of Gotham. And it was this, you know, group of, you know, one percenters or something, super powerful people that wear these owl masks that are trying to hurt Gotham and, and capitalize on all of the misfortunes of it. And, uh, and then, you know, ha have their own vision of its future um, in a way. And I thought that was going to be some kind of big reveal because I was just like, well, what, otherwise, why is he doing this? And really his goals weren't as big as I thought they were. Uh, so that kind of let me down a little bit. He was just just trying to take down evil people. And he thought one of them would be Bruce Wayne because his father, apparently when he was mayor, made a deal with Carmine Falcone because there was someone after, like someone trying to dig on uh, Martha, um, you know, uh, Batman's mom, um, who was, I know that's also Superman's mom's name, uh, but Martha Wayne, uh, she's her, originally in this movie, they she's an Arkham. So she's Martha Arkham. Um, and, and then his father, Thomas Wayne, is uh, you know from the Wayne family, and these two families were the kind of the founding members of Gotham, which comes from one of the comic books. Actually, there's a comic book called The Gates of Gotham, where it talks about the Waynes, the Arkhams, and the Cobblepots, and uh, and then I think the Elliots also, and how they were like the four pillars of Gotham, trying to build it up. Uh, or maybe there's another family I can't, I'm not thinking of right now, but because uh, it's been a while since I read that book. But that was in there, and then also the Telltale Batman video game. They talked about you know, the, his mom being an Arkham, I think, in that one, and his dad doing semi-shady stuff to kind of protect her and, you know, but it kind of tied him up with the mob, you know. Um, I think there's even a scene in this movie where Carmine Falcone reveals to Bruce, your dad once pulled a bullet out of me, and, you know, and Bruce's like, yeah, my dad was a doctor, though, and that's what his job was. He took a Hippocratic oath uh, to save everybody, you know, no matter who they are, and Carmine Falcone thought that was funny, but it did put Thomas Wayne it did put Falcone in debt to Thomas Wayne. So when Thomas Wayne said, hey, this guy, this reporter named Elliot, which they sh literally show on a TV screen and say hush over him because um, they said hush money was involved. So it was like, so I think this is clearly a setup for the character Hush. Uh, in the comics, Thomas Elliot was a friend of Bruce Wayne's when he was a kid, and he actually uh, killed his parents to inherit their money. Um, but unfortunately, he was only able to kill, well, unfortunately for him, he was only able to kill his dad and his mom lived, and so he had to live with this overbearing, awful woman his whole life that kind of turned him and twisted him into the uh, villain that he eventually becomes out of jealousy for Bruce Wayne living a life without his parents. Uh, talk about twisted, right? Uh, he was actually jealous Bruce Wayne's parents did die and that Bruce grew up with all this money, and that's what Thomas Elliot wanted. So that was a, that's the comic version. In this one, it looks like Carmine Falcone, you know, Thomas Wayne went to him and said, hey, 
someone's digging into my wife and she's a former, she was an Arkham. She's part of the Arkham family and she has mental issues. Like she, she has, um, um, you know, mental he uh, health issues and she's struggling with depression and, and, uh, and possibly schizophrenic thoughts and, and she's getting better and she got treatment and I love her. And I, and I, I, you know, we have a son together and we have a family and she's getting better, but I don't want her past to, to be shown this way. It could, re-trigger her you know in, in that way and it could cause to a downfall and he goes and i don't want that to happen i really love my wife so carmine falcone is like okay i'll go make sure this guy you know stays quiet and uh, and hushes up and you know and thomas wayne's like but don't kill him like just just get him to you know pay him whatever he wants and get him to shut up and of course carmine Fal falcone goes and kills that guy uh which is you know i think thomas elliott's father because he's his name is elliott and he's a reporter or whatever. So I think that gives motivation now for a sequel to where Thomas Elliott is going to go look for the guy who killed his dad. And he's going to find out Thomas Wayne was involved with Carmine Falcone to do it. And since both Thomas Wayne and Falcone are dead, he's going to turn his sights probably on their kids, uh, which in this movie we reveal, much like the uh, uh, Win in Rome comic book, the Catwoman Win in Rome by uh, Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale, we find out Carmine Falcone is the father of Catwoman, uh, which is also from the comics. And then obviously uh, Bruce Wayne being the son of uh, Martha and Thomas, um, that will also be, a, a, you know, that's the, he's their kid. So now Thomas Elliott has two targets. He can go after the kids of the people that killed his parents. So that's a setup for that, I think. Uh, and that to me, I found, even though it was such a small part of the movie, I found that more interesting than some of the Riddler stuff. Uh, Paul Dano, I think, did a good job, but... Out of everyone in the movie, you know, um, you know John Turturro, who plays uh, Carmen Falcone, and uh, Zoe Kravitz, who plays Catwoman, like, I liked everybody in this movie. I think Paul Dano was the one pill that was a little hard to swallow sometimes for me. I really liked that he committed to the character and to the role, but at times he was a little too screechy and over the top for me, and I, I'm sure that worked for the character, and it kind of does, I guess, for that interpretation of Riddler, but it also, like, took me out of the movie enough to where it irritated me. Um, so I hope, you know, he's caught in the end and they kind of do that typical thing where the bad guy gets caught and then he, it turns out that's kind of what he wants. And he wants Batman and him to be in Arkham while the city explodes and, and drowns because there's, you know, dams, I guess, around Gotham and they explode and water just starts flooding parts of the city. And that's what Riddler wanted ultimately in the end is to inspire other people to come out with their guns to shoot at you know the, the the rich and powerful and kind of had a very modern day approach to you know i guess what people deem as villains nowadays and stuff so i, I thought that was interesting but i again that's what happens when you ground stuff you start mirroring the real world and that ruins some of the escapism for me and so that that's why i don't like a realistic batman sometimes because you feel drawn to do these things that mirror what's happening in reality and i kind of just want my batman to be a little bit more unrealistic and, and not so much mirror reality and and be more of a an escape and this this movie although it was good didn't feel like an escape uh at, at all in in some regards so um so yeah but still uh, paul dano gets captured at the end and then turns out he has a cell a, a guy in a cell next to him that he starts talking to and it's the joker which leads me to the deleted scene that they just revealed, um, which is Barry, and I'm, I'm blanking on his last name, uh, but uh, he was in The Eternals recently, I think, and he apparently, uh, in this scene, he's the Joker. Like, there's a deleted scene that's like five minutes long where they do with the Joker, which I've always wanted to do. I always said if I ever wrote a Batman story, the Joker would be Hannibal Lecter. He would be the guy in the cell that Batman goes to and talks to, um, you know, to try to figure out you know, how to stop Scarecrow or whoever else and to kind of get an insight on these characters. I always said if I ever did that, if I ever wrote a Batman story, that's what Joker's role would be. He would be Hannibal Lecter. And that's straight up what this scene is. So I liked it. I liked the scene. I liked the performance. I think Barry did a great job as as Joker. I thought he was really strong as the character in that scene. Um, and he kind of did his own thing. There was a little bit of Heath Ledger, a little bit of Jack Nicholson, and, and a lot of his own kind of approach to it, uh, where he's just full on out there. He's got scars on him, looks like acid burns on the back of his head. It's like stitched together like it would be if it was like split open. Like it, he looks intense and maniacal. And I thought that was really neat. And uh, I, I, I kind of wish that scene stayed in the movie because at the end when, when Riddler and Joker meet, you just kind of see Joker's silhouette. And I, and that might even be played by a different actor. I don't know. Um, but, uh, but anyway, that scene 
I didn't like that scene. I was like, oh man, Joker really? But if they are, but if this five minutes was put into the movie and it established that Joker was already there, I would have probably liked that end scene a little bit more. So them taking it out, I think actually hurt the film. And, and normally sometimes you take stuff out and it's like, oh, that was probably a good idea that you took that out. In this case, I, I don't feel so. I feel like that scene would have been great because then by the end I'd be like, okay, now they're teaming up. And my theory now, uh, and me and my friend Nate were talking about this is that they really need to adapt Arkham Asylum, the, the comic book, like the Grant Morrison one, because uh, at the end of this movie, you have Joker and Riddler. What better story to tell next than them two plotting with each other to lure Batman back to Arkham to make it look like they're escaping. And then Batman comes in and they lock Batman in with them. And then that way you can throw in all these cameos that you want to throw in there. You can throw in Scarecrow, Poison Ivy. You can kind of squeeze in Maxi Zeus, you know, if you want to do that. Just like a crazy guy who thinks he can control lightning or something. Um, Calendar Man. I think that would be really, really cool in the sequel is if they do that. And that would even make it harder for Tommy Elliot or whatever to, to get his revenge on Bruce and Batman because he's stuck in Arkham and Tommy has to like get in there, you know, to get his revenge or something. Um, I think that would be really cool. I think that could be make a single location, you know, kind of like a diehard story. You have Gordon outside communicating with Batman on the inside, trying to figure things out. I think that would be freaking awesome. And then that way you can get these nice, good solo Batman stories out of the way so that if you do a third movie, you can start bringing in characters like Robin and stuff and Nightwing. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I Overall though, I like this movie, I did. I just didn't love it, and I see a lot of a super praise for it, which is great. I'm glad people are liking DC stuff, um, you know, because I, as a DC fan, I, I like Marvel, obviously, too, but as a DC fan, I want DC to succeed, and so to see the praise this movie is getting is awesome. Like, it is really awesome, whether I fully agree with it or not, but it is a good movie. I mean, it is you have to see it. It is worth watching, in my opinion, um, and I might even say worth owning. Um, there's enough in this, like some of the detective stuff he does and you know, some of it's not really that great. He's kind of behind the curve. But like I said, if you add the Joker scene in, Joker tells Batman, you know, you're normally ahead of the curve. It's weird that you can't get this Riddler guy all by yourself and that you're coming to ask me for help because you normally can do this on your own. I like that because then it establishes that Batman has been on his game and has been really good up until this point. It helps establish that. Um, that is kind of established in the movie, but not as clearly. Uh, and I think that scene with Joker would have helped drive that home a little bit more. So yeah, I wish the deleted scene was in there, but overall great film. I mean, you know, and it didn't feel like three hours. I know a lot of people probably are saying that, but to me it didn't, I, I didn't feel its length at all. I did get removed from the movie a few times based on some a few performance moments and, and things like that. And, and some things that I felt like could have been cut down. Cause honestly, I feel like you could have added that Joker scene in and probably still cut 20 minutes from this movie because some scenes just run unnecessarily long uh, just for no reason uh, and and they're not building really good tension in some of those scenes and some of that stuff i'm like God, you could trim this and make it more effective uh, but that's just the editor in me and that's just also my personal opinion so let me know if you agree with that or not and if you do or don't let me know down below in the comments and as always we'll keep talking and continuing the conversation down there all right this has gone long enough so thank you so much for watching this episode i'll try to get more content to you very very soon including for you dc fans and marvel fans a review of Justice League Avengers, which was recently reproduced and remade uh, by the uh, Hero Initiative in honor of George Perez, one of the legends of comic book drawing, who has fallen ill recently and is possibly in the last few months of his life. And they wanted to get this out there before he passes. And it's just a wonderful, beautiful book that Kurt Busiek wrote and George drew the entire, the whole thing. And it's, it's fantastic. It was a four issue series. And I believe this is the last time officially that Marvel and DC characters were ever printed in a comic book together. Because soon after this, Disney bought Marvel and DC became more of a, you know, connected to Warner Brothers. Uh, not that it wasn't before, but just that that kind of grip from those companies, uh, those corporations took over. And so, uh, so it, it prevents probably any more team ups ever or any more crossovers ever between the Marvel and DC universe. So this is a real piece of comic book history here, and we're going to talk about it very, very soon. So thank you so much for watching this episode. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.